Man, see, like, you don't even know, man. We're going, it's like you're born into this world, man. And you got like, it's like this, man, a dust in the wind, man. Or like a dang old candle in the wind, man. You go, it don't matter, man. It's not the old, old, old town. You know what I think, man? Like that dang old, I think, therefore you are, man. Welcome to the opening of a new series called Mantras, Truths, Myths, or Misbeliefs. The word mantra, according to Siri, is a commonly heard word or phrase. I did a survey a few months ago. I asked all my email contacts and all my Facebook connections and Facebook groups that I'm in to contribute to this survey, what is a commonly heard phrase that you've heard repeated, maybe you've even said it yourself, that we often hear said in our culture as an answer to life's unanswered questions or as a means of encouraging someone. So they begin to contribute them. And I got dozens and dozens of responses from people. And from those responses, I compiled a list of 50 statements that are said by people, and then I went to a thing called Survey Monkey service on the internet and created a 50 statement survey, and once again sent an opportunity, a link to that, to all my email contacts and all my Facebook connections, and said, Hey, here's a survey. Look at it and vote on what you think is not relevant or relevant or most relevant. So everything that scored on the side of being more than just relevant had to score more than two. And from that, I came up with the top 12. Aren't you glad it wasn't 50? (laughs) Coming in, number one is a statement that people often hear said to encourage others or to show their faith or whatever. And it's a statement, God is always in control. Statement number two, the Lord won't give you more than you can handle. Number three, the often heard phrase, everything happens for a reason. Number four, only God can judge me. Five, Christians should never judge. Six, a healthy marriage is a 50-50 proposition. (laughs) Number seven, the Lord works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. Number eight, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Number nine, if you spare the rod, you will spoil the child. Number 10, this too shall pass. Number 11, let your conscience be your guide. And number 12, God wants me to be happy. I want to examine each of these, not in one Sunday, but in 12 times that I speak, not 12 consecutive Sundays. But when I'm speaking, the next 12 times I'm going to speak on each of those will start at the bottom. I already have kind of spoken along these lines a few months ago when we spoke on it is what it is. Who remembers? It is what it is. How is that true and how is that not true? How can it be applied to our life and how can it be abused? We want to avoid that. Let's read our text today. These scriptures are written on the card that's in your bulletin. Paul is writing an apprentice leader of a church that he has raised up, a young man that he has been a spiritual father to. Verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly or clearly or explicitly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Now this is what the Holy Spirit's inspiring Paul to write. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines or teachings of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And then he goes on and begins to share some of those teachings, like forbidding people to get married and legalism trying to creep into the church. A similar passage is written twice in Second Timothy, his second letter to the same guy, written by Paul as well, chapter 3. He's telling him how to be a leader and not to be quarrelsome, but to try to always be gentle and to teach with humility and patience and to help people escape the snares of the devil, not being taken captive by him to do his will. Chapter 3, verse 1, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Can we say perilous times? Verse 2, for men will be lovers of themselves, 
lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control. We live in that day where self-control is a lost art. Well, yeah, I burglarize that home because I'm addicted to Twinkies. I can't help it. I mean, there's crazy things that going on in our courtrooms to attempt to give people reasons. Psychologists in their efforts to help people, I think, are actually hurting them. But anyway, that's a whole other subject. Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Lord, help us not to be these kind of people. Help us to allow your power to rule and reign in our lives. In Jesus' name. You know, the New Testament is written to warn us, because we could head this way as well. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, they had a problem with gullible women in their day. We have a problem with gullible men in our day. I mean, both genders are vulnerable to temptation. Amen? I did hear a story of a gullible person that was taken advantage of by one of these misleaders it was in the Washington, D.C. area. This guy was visiting this church, and he was giving people personal prophecies. They didn't seem right, so someone ran and told the leadership of the church, and the leaders made a mistake and deemed it not important enough to deal with. Let's, you know, let's, everybody needs to use their gifts, and there's room for mistakes, and you know, no apologies needed. This guy persuaded a woman to let him minister deliverance to her at her house. Said, you've got a problem with demons. We need to go deeper with this. When can I come to your house? Oh, you can come tomorrow. And he got in her house. He told her, this house is so full of demons, I'm going to have to move in here. It's going to take me six weeks to get them all out. This guy was a homeless goon taking advantage of someone gullible. Six months later, he's still living there. I think he moved some demons into her house. All right, chapter 4. Remember, he's speaking to this leader. I charge you, verse 1, Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Can we say preach? Be ready in season and out of season. Can we say be ready? This is talking about more than just having an impromptu sermon ready, but we should all be ready to proclaim the truth when given an opportunity. Well, I'm just not prayed up. Well, say, Lord, help. There you are. You're prayed up. (laughs) Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time, verse 3, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching. Doctrine is not a bad word. It's a good word. False doctrine is a bad word, all right? It means teaching. The time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. So hence is the reason for our sermon today. How many have heard this phrase? Maybe you've said this phrase. God wants me to be happy. We're going to look at this, how it is not true, and then we're going to look at it, how it is true. Don't want to confuse you. There's reasons God doesn't want you to be happy, and there are reasons God does want you to be happy. So hang with me. Couldn't have picked a better one myself. It's top of the line. All the options. The only thing it can't do is fly. No, I'm just licking. This one is way out of my price range. Oh, see, now there's your problem. Price range is really just a frame of mind. The facts are that you work hard. You deserve this. And God wants you to be happy. (laughs) Don't be taken captive by salesmen. 
there was a guy who used to come to church here years ago. They moved somewhere else. He went to sales training, and he was taught how to deal with Christians. Now, here he is, a Christian, listening to this. Oh, I tell you how to get a Christian to, I won't tell you what they were selling, but it would involve people going into debt. I tell you how to get Christians to buy, to say, oh, you're a Christian? Well, why don't you pray about it? And if the loan goes through, if the loan gets approved, then you know it's God's will. God wants you to be happy. How many people go into debt in the pursuit of happiness? Now, I know our Constitution, it can't guarantee, but the vision for our country is that we all have the freedom to pursue happiness. So if anybody takes that away from you, they are affecting your freedoms. Okay? But I would hope you'd leave here today and realize that the pursuit of happiness cannot be the governing force of our life. The pursuit of holiness should be the governing force. What's some other happiness quotes? If it makes you happy, it can't be all bad. There's a country song that says that. If it makes you happy, then why the hell are you so sad? Cheryl Crow, she sang that. There are some things that make you happy that are bad. I mean, they'll make you happy right now, but tomorrow you're going to be pretty sad. Love that song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, Bobby McFerrin wrote. Here's a little song that I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry, be happy. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry, be happy. Ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry, be happy. The landlord say your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry. Be happy. Ain't got no cash. Ain't got no style. Ain't got no girl to make you smile. Don't worry. Be happy. Because when you worry, your face will frown, and that will bring everybody down. Don't worry. Be happy. Fun stuff. We love stuff like that. The Bible says, He who takes away a garment in cold weather or puts vinegar on soda, is like someone who sings songs to a heavy heart. Some people really are in mourning. And for us to force them to fake happiness, that's being cruel. It's like taking away their coat on a cold day. Mourn with those who mourn. And rejoice with those who rejoice. Someone down in the dumps, don't rebuke them. Some churches are not safe to be honest in. You get these religious platitudes. God wants you happy. Meanwhile, you're going through a struggle that's really hard. You need empathy. You don't need somebody cheapening it with these statements. But I still love the happy stuff. Uh, I grew up in churches that used to sing during the greeting time, Smile a while and give your face a rest. Raise your hand to the one you love the best. Turn around to someone near, shake their hand with your hand up, you know, and smile. Or if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Yeah. Or the old Southern Gospel song by the Lefevers. This was the family Milan Lefevre grew up in. If you're happy, notify your face. Take that frown off. And put a smile in his place. If you love Jesus, go tell it to the human race. If you're happy, notify your face. <laughs> now, here's one that's really popular right now in the secular realm. If you do an image search on happiness, you'll find all sorts of cute posters and Hallmark greeting cards and pithy sayings and cute sayings with truth in every one of them. But when fully embraced, it actually can be untruth. Here's one here. Life is full of choices, and I choose happiness. 
Happiness is a choice is another one that you'll read. There you go. That could be singing happy songs to a heavy heart. It's like taking away their coat when it's sub-zero temperatures. You're being cruel. There's a time to weep, a time to mourn, a time to live, and a time to die. There's a time for everything under the sun. How about this one? Whatever you decide to do, make sure it makes you happy. Because it's all about you. You know what the American hymn is? Nobody sings it, but everybody lives it. It's to the tune of Amazing Grace. Me, 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 me. God wants us to be happy. We're going to look at how this is untrue and then how it can become true. How many want it to become true? How can our happiness, being something God wants us to have, be untrue? If pursuing happiness makes me a selfish person, God doesn't want our happiness. If you relate to God like you would a vending machine or a Coke machine, you know, you deposit the money, you make their selection, and if it doesn't come out of the machine, you're not happy. Somebody's child put a bunch of pennies in the machine or something's broke in it. You're just not happy. Well, if you approach God like that, God, I, I'm obeying you. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I made my deposits. I paid my tithe. I gave in the offering. I helped somebody's dog. I this, that, and the other. And I'm still going through hard times. I want happiness, and I want it now. With God, who's eternal, his promises are true. And he made promises centuries ago. Some of them, we're still waiting on the fulfillment of them. They haven't been fulfilled for anybody yet, like the return of Christ. Hello? So keep your faith in him. That's the purpose of faith. If wanting happiness distracts us from our callings, God doesn't want us to be happy. Terry and Ingvold Snow were with us here last year. I mean, last Sunday. They were here last year too, Okay. And they went through some hard times, especially in the early years of of establishing their base. What if the pursuit of happiness was the governing principle of their life and they quit? They would not be experiencing their current happiness, would they not? Sometimes you go through things for the sake of the future. Any ladies had babies? For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. That wasn't happy. The resurrection, happy. Happiness is not the seed, it's the fruit. And some things take longer to bear fruit than others. How long does it take for an olive tree to bear olives? Fifteen years? Fifteen years. Ooh, that's too long. But how long will olive tree, once it begins to bear, continue to bear? Thank you very much. Three or four thousand years of harvest. That's a pretty good investment, isn't it? There's a thing in sociology, in studying the classes of people, there's a thing they call delayed gratification. That the differences between the poorest people in the world and the successful people in the world is this thing called delayed gratification. If you're able to hold off from getting your happiness now, you can save enough to invest something. This is a principle that affects your whole life. It's not just money. But if gratification, personal gratification, is something you want now, it leads to poverty. It just does. You'll eat your seed. I want olives now. I guess you wouldn't eat the seed, but anyway, you got the point. If you're eating olive seeds, stop it. Plant them. God gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. So eat your bread. Don't send that bread to the TV preacher. But keep your seed in the kingdom and eat your bread. It's for your family. Enjoy it. God wants us to be happy, but he doesn't want us to be happy if seeking happiness becomes my number one priority, the governing principle of my life. When we do that, happiness becomes a God, right? In reality, there's two gods involved in that. Happiness and me. 
And if happiness becomes the ruling force of our life, guess what? Happiness comes and goes. If happiness causes me to make my decisions, then I'm becoming gullible. Got this in the mail yesterday. Sorry, baby, I scarfed some of your mail. It's a woman's clothing catalog, and the title of the catalog is hashtag instant happiness. Now, be honest with me. If you got a new outfit right now, would you instantly be happy? Yes, you would experience happiness. But this kind of happiness won't last forever. Eventually, you'll either grow out or, or something will go wrong with it or you'll lose it or you'll wear it out or it'll go out of style. What happened to the clothes that made you happy last year? Why do you want something new? What's the deal? It's only 100% down, easy monthly payments. It was just too good to pass up. <laughs> if chasing happiness makes us do something wrong, oh, if I could just be with her or I could just be with him, she'd make me happy or he'd make me happy. If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. God is not into that kind of happiness because it leads to our unhappiness and it leads to other people being unhappy too. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33 to those who are worrying about what they're going to wear, where they're going to live, what they're going to do, seek first the kingdom of God. Can we say first? And His righteousness. Can we say righteousness? His commands telling us how to live will lead to happiness. They'll lead to clothes and food and shelter. But he must be first. In the Sermon on the Mount, he gave the Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That word there for blessed could also mean happy. When I'm being merciful, I am concerned with the happiness of someone else. When I'm being meek, happiness is not ruling my life. God wants you to be happy. Tell your neighbor that. How can this phrase be true? When I learn that my happiness comes from pursuing other things, more important things, creates happiness. When I understand that, the will of God, God wants me to be happy. But it's in the long range. For the joy set before us, we look to Jesus. We're to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, who for the joy set before him endured the cross in front of him. So we live for the sake of the future and go through the state of the present. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, which can be synonymous with happiness. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So we're going to have troubles, but our leader has already overcome those troubles, and he knows how to lead us through to victory if we'll follow him. So it's the pursuit of Jesus that leads to happiness. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord, Psalm 144, 15. 146.5, happy is he who has a God of Jacob for his help, whose help is in the Lord his God. He who has mercy on the poor, happy is he, Proverbs 14.21. There's a joy that comes to you when you help somebody else. It's the pleasure of God. There's a need that is a key to your happiness. And that need isn't your need for happiness, it's a need for helping somebody. Somebody's in need of help. Proverbs 16.20, whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. If I trust him, I won't let my troubles get me down. Got a lot of songs in my head today. (laughs) Jamaicans sing, hallelujah, anyhow, I never let my trouble get me down. If I will remember his will for me, will often prevent my going through hardship. His will will lead you. There's a verse that says the way of transgressors is hard. Sometimes we're unhappy because we've been rebellious. 
and we're experiencing the consequences of our decision. Proverbs 28, 14, happy is the man who is always, can we say always, always reverent. He always reveres the Lord. Happy is a person who's always revering God, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. God's will can prevent problems, but not all problems. Because our next statement is, we need to remember that his will for us will often include our going through hardship. His will can prevent hardship, but his will can also include hardship. Because ain't everybody out there saved. I find out you're a believer. Here comes the attacks. 1 Peter 3.14, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. There's a grace that comes upon us if we'll forgive those who've persecuted you. Maybe you've been fired because you were a Christian and you didn't do anything sanctimonious or self-righteous to get yourself fired. Some Christians do that. Peter also wrote, if you suffer, make sure it's for doing good and not being stupid. But I believe if you'll forgive those who persecuted you, there's going to come a joy to your heart. Wow, Jesus, I feel like I know you more now than ever. I know you in the fellowship of your sufferings. The next chapter, verse 14, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. There is a presence of God manifested to those who suffer for doing right. So sometimes his will includes hardship, but you've got to have a long-range vision. Don't live just for today. Don't live just in the moment, but live for the sake of the joy set before him. Jesus endured the cross, so do we. And finally, if you will live in light of the fact that your life here is temporary, but heaven's joys are eternal, which is where you really belong, God wants you to be happy. My happiness comes from my future. The devil reminds you of your past, remind him of your future and his future. Max Lucado wrote a devotional. He said, the only ultimate disaster that can befall us, I have come to realize, is to feel ourselves to be at home here on earth. As long as we remember we are aliens, we cannot forget our true homeland. Unhappiness on earth can cultivate a hunger for heaven. By gracing us with a deep dissatisfaction, God can hold our attention. The only tragedy, then, is to be satisfied prematurely, to settle for earth and earthly things, to be content in this strange land. We are not totally happy here because we're not at home here. We're not ultimately always going to be happy here because we're not supposed to ultimately and always be happy here. We are, like Peter wrote in his first letter, chapter 2, like foreigners and strangers in this world. You're an alien. I could ask for a show of hands for everyone who's absolutely, totally happy about everything in your life, from your finances to your relationships to your ministry to where you live to what you have to wear, and no one would raise their hand. Or some guy that's ultimately cast his cares on the Lord, he's found his joys in him, he would, and that would ruin my illustration. He goes on to write, take a fish, place him on the beach, watch his gills gasp and his scales dry. Is he happy? No. Try to make him happy. Cover him with a mountain of cash. Get a beach chair and some nice Ray-Ban sunglasses. Bring him a good fishing magazine that won't offend him and a martini wardrobe him in a double-breasted fin suit and people skin shoes. <laughs> Will he be happy? Of course not. How do you make him happy? Put him back in his element. Put him back in the water. He will never be happy on the beach simply because he was not made 
for the beach. And you will never be completely happy here on earth because you're not made for the earth. You're made for heaven. Oh, we have moments of joy, glimpses of heavenly light, tastes of heaven. I tasted heaven today while we were worshiping. You'll know moments, even days and seasons of peace, but they do not compare to our happiness that lies ahead. God wants you to be happy for eternity. Can we pray? Lord, I thank you for your truth. And I thank you, Lord, for the element of truth that is in the mantras of our culture that point them to you, make us skillful as we hear these truths to apply them to our personal lives but be able to share them appropriately with those who don't know you. In Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, for that person who's struggling. There's nothing in their life that's making them happy right now. I pray, Lord, that you would set their affections, their attention on things above. Cause their dissatisfaction to draw them near to you. In Jesus' name. Forgive us for being shallow and prematurely trying to cheer people up that need to be mourned with. Enable us, Lord, to rejoice with those who are rejoicing when we're weeping. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Lord, may we learn to count it all joy, according to James chapter 1, when we go through various trials, knowing that those tough times are making us more like you. 